All right. Welcome to the Actors Voice uh, Conversations with uh, Conversations on Singing and Acting with John and Russ. Uh, today with us we have Josh Hamilton from Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, Josh, uh, since graduating from Bowling Green State University with his bachelor's in vocal performance, Josh has been working as a professional singer in opera, musical theater, cruise ship entertainment, national tours, and the like. He's been a professional singer for, at Disney, performed multiple national tours, including Mamma Mia, Spamalot, um, done a ton of regional theater, with, uh, shows like Les Mis, Rent, and My Fair Lady. You may have seen Josh in commercials as an opera singing potato chip for Ruffles. Uh, or, sorry, opera singing potato. <laughs> for, for Ruffles, cheddar, and sour cream and potato chips. Um, over the past several years, his career has taken him to nearly 85 countries, including North, the North Pole once, and Antarctica and the Amazon River 30 times. Welcome, Josh. Hello, how are you? <laughs> really good, man. How are you? I'm doing great. Things are getting <laughs> crazy around here. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> crazy or, the, or they're getting better. I don't know. <laughs> Can't tell yet. Maybe, maybe 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 we're through the the bad part. Hopefully, fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah. At this point, right? Um, so, Josh, we always start off um, here in the actors' voice conversations with the same first question. Um, so, we're going to ask you about your journey. Uh, what brought you, to, uh, you know, kind of from uh, through school to where you are now into this crazy profession? Oh yeah. So, um, well. After graduating uh, from Bowling Green, I went to Chicago and I, I was basically only doing opera there for about three years. Um, and I, I was able to do with a couple of different companies like Chicago Opera Theater. And then I worked with a couple of smaller places. Uh, one was called Doc Cornetto and then the other one was Chamber Opera Chicago. And that pretty much kept me going most of the time for that, that whole period of time. I was able to do Carmen, and then there was a uh, a couple versions of uh, Amal and Night Visitors that was put up every year, so I got to do that. I did the opera Elizabeth, that was pretty nice, not normally done, which is pretty cool. Um, and then after that, I I moved to New York and I I started doing ships, and then the ships took me all over the place. I worked for Holland America for four years, Princess once, and then I just did a Norwegian contract recently. Um, and then within that, I did uh, the tour of Spamalot. I did like 206 shows of that. And then I did Mamma Mia for two years, and I did 430 performances of that. And um, after that, it was time to take a break and, and lay down for a while. <laughs> 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 Fair enough. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, I, I would love to to talk a little bit about your experiences on. And we can take two different trains, two different questions here, but experiences both uh, on the cruise ships and experiences as a, a touring production doing 400 shows. What's life like um, a, as a singer, as an actor, uh, getting into that? Because I I don't know about you know most everybody who's listening, but for me. The idea of, of singing on a cruise ship or the idea of being on a national tour uh, and what that really entails as an undergrad, I, I had no clue. Well, um, I think that they're both different things. The ship is a, is a completely different job than being on a tour. And um, I, I think when you, when you do a ship, you're mostly hired as a crew member. Um, and so you have to follow the rules of the crew um, and you, you learn several different shows it could be four to six different shows um now they're putting musicals up on ships which is what i just did with norwegian i did a uh a, uh basically like an original version of footloose the musical uh mm -hmm. with the director from school of rock his name is david rutura and uh so they brought in some big names to put it together and i went back out on the ship just to get to to do a musical on a ship because i had never done one um, and touring, I would say it is exhausting because <laughs> um, <laughs> at least on the ship, you're, you, you're on a schedule. So you, you do the same shows every week. You're living on the boat. You just walk upstairs to the theater on a tour. You are getting on a bus. It, it could be, it depending on what kind of tour it is. Like I, I've done non-union tours. So, um, you could be getting on a bus between 5.30 and 8 o'clock in the morning, and then you could travel in 10 hours into a show. And then 
you're doing your show that night. And then you'll do two Saturday, two Sunday, and then obviously have your Mondays off. <clears throat> so, yeah, it can be quite grueling, and then that actually can be quite taxing on your voice doing a tour because you're just constantly getting on a plane or getting on a bus and then driving to the next venue. Um, I remember the closing week of Mamma Mia, they drove us two, it was two driving days into our show to the closing weekend. And we drove into the show on Friday, did Friday to Saturday to Sunday. And then I got sent home and I was, went to bed for like two days. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. That's wild. So, I mean, now, do you, did you develop preferences? You've, you've, you've done it all. So um, did you like the ships better or did you like doing the national tours? Um, I think that there are pros and cons of both because um, the ship, uh, with the ships, you get paid a lot more. <laughs> One really great thing about it is you get paid really well. And, and you do get to sit still, even though the ship is moving around. Um, but with that comes with a lot of rules and regulations and things that you have to follow. And I, I think I would prefer a tour, even though it's more grueling. Um, and I think because when you're on a tour, you're, even though I was a non-union cast member, um, you're going into union houses and you still have to follow the union rules which which is what they do and yeah you're just i i think that they respect the art a lot more it's it's much more about the work and it's much more professional which is what i feel that's interesting great great perspective yeah so um you did the national tour of spam a lot what um, were you were you doing ensemble stuff or kind of mario stuff? Uh, no so I played Galahad in that one. Galahad, awesome. And then I was also Concord. And then I was the mother for a second. <laughs> I was the mother only in the moment where they, uh, where the, she brings out the shrubbery and it's the only time you see the shrubbery. Yeah. And, and he, the, the king would ask you if the, he would ask me if that's a shrubbery and, and I would just say, Oh, it's something the cat brought in and, brought in but i always wanted to to screw the show up because it would be the, it was the only moment that the king saw the shrubbery and when he asked if it was a shrubbery i always wanted to be like nope and then just walk away <laughs> take it off the stage <laughs> it would have messed up the whole show <laughs> all that power right you're like all that, i have the power to derail this show right yeah <laughs> that was a great show because the audience knows the lines better than you. <laughs> and even when things go wrong, they know that things are going wrong and it's hilarious to them. So like one of the times, uh, the boars, the guy who gets killed by the killer rabbit, his head comes off of a spring and then it's just like this stupid red ribbon that comes out of the top of his hat and his head is in his chest, but the hat, the, the head is on top of him. So one of the times the, uh, the spring popped off, but the head got caught on the ribbon. And so it just fell and was dangling there. <laughs> and he, and he, you could tell that the guy inside the costume, he was like, I don't know where the head went. So he just stood there for a second. And then like, very like getting hit like Power Rangers. He just like fell over like five seconds later. <laughs> <laughs> and the, we had to stop the show for about maybe a minute and a half because they were laughing so hard. The show <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so fantastic. There, those uh, shows that have that the kind of cold following are, are, are wonderful. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did a production of Rocky Horror. Um, we yeah. did the stage show, uh, not mm -hmm. the a shadow cast thing we did the stage show at the college and um the audiences you get like you said know know the show um oh, yeah especially with that that one's full of you know full of the call outs and the whole deal so we did the real experience um but it's it's wild because you have those live performance moments right the things that yeah. go completely sideways <laughs> that's live theater it you is gotta right. roll with it uh, all the time and it's Nothing nice like to it. 
it's nice to talk about it at a time where we're not seeing so much of it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, absolutely. So that's really cool, man. Um, so you've been, um, you know, you took a break from your from your touring schedule. Are you going to go back out after after everything ends? Like, what's what's next? I'm super curious. I honestly have no idea. Uh, I'm kind of like everyone else. I have no idea. I think I think that I. Um, I have a girlfriend now who I just met maybe like eight months ago. And um, so I'm kind of maybe settling down a little bit more. And I, I think that in the last couple of years, that's been something that I've been wanting to do is definitely settle down a little more. Um, I, I don't know. I don't, I really don't know. I, I kind of would like to get back more into the opera stuff and, and work with that. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's always been the goal, and I, I think I've been distracted by like flashy objects and going different places, and, and, so, and you know, so yeah, I, I think I would rather sit and and work on and work on my voice for a while. I think that's that's awesome, and it really um, it's nice uh, to talk like this for for this series in particular because you know our our, our kind of core audience are, are these young our students really um, students who are looking to make this uh, this crazy leap that we all did in one way or another towards a career uh, in performing arts, and we don't always know, you know. I think yeah. that's, that's there's so much there's so much unknown in this business, and even even when you think that things are going well, even in the auditions, like you can, you can make it to the final, final rounds of things. And, you know, I've, I've been in situations where I get to the, it's like me and one other person, and then they give it to a guy because he's already done the role before, or he's, he was just doing it on the tour. Um, and then what can you do? You can't do anything about that. Okay. You, all you can say is that I was happy I made it this far. I'm glad they were looking at me. Mm -hmm. So, well, let, let's talk about the the great unknowns a little bit. Um, you've had two big moves: moving to Chicago and moving to New York. What's that experience like? Uh, moving to a new city and trying to embed into the the arts, cultural, musical scene, uh, finding auditions, finding gigs. That's a great question. Uh, so, I, I've also lived in LA. I lived in LA for like seven years ish. Um, Chicago was first from like 06 to 09. And then I moved, I moved to New York two times. Um, and I would say what I feel about that is it takes a good, even without being in the arts at all, it takes a good six months at least to settle down and like really get your footing. And, and then the networking at, you know, can start happening while you're doing that. But, but yeah, I, I think it takes at least a good six months of, getting yourself in the door um and and i i also think with with like la because i i did some commercial auditions and i was also doing theater while i was out there i i think with that environment um every facet so every bit part of the business whether you're doing commercials that's a whole other separate networking of people that you have to go through and it could be years and years of you going through audition after audition and then theater is a completely different group of people and then tv and film completely different group of people so yeah so you're you're really setting up kind of uh you know compartments within your network you have your, your yeah. theater network you have your commercial network you have uh, absolutely all of these different kind of facets of that uh, i think that's yeah. that's great um so i not to de derail us in, in <laughs> direction but you brought up a commercial so talk about the opera singing potato for a minute because <laughs> let that go uh so that was a really crazy audition um i had probably done they say if you book like one out of a hundred that you're doing well and i would say most people don't do that i mean i only got one commercial um but what commercial auditions are like nowadays are it's very improvisation so they're going to ask you to do a lot of improv it's also following directions they'll literally tell you what they want you to do when they walk in the room and they'll explain it a hundred times and it's honestly amazing how many people can't follow directions who are like tv and film people who can't 
they can't follow directions. And I think that, I think that comes from, you know, people on the stage, we're used to getting notes like right on the spot. And then you work on that thing right in front of the director and the producers. And so you have to show progress because they're right there in front of you and you're used to taking notes. And I think with TV and film, I think they get notes, but then they go sit in their trailer by themselves or whatever. So yeah, I, <laughs> but the, okay. So the opera or the, the potato audition, that, that was actually very interesting. Cause I was, I was booking the tour of Mamma Mia at the same time that I was booking that commercial. And it was really crazy. Uh, it's a lot, it was just a lot of whirlwind of an experience for sure. Um, I basically went into the audition for the commercial and I had pre-planned to sing the opening of the magic flute, which is the very first thing the tenor sings. Yeah. So I just started singing that and then they wanted me to improvise the words ridges. So I just started implementing that into the, the melody of that, of the magic flute. And, uh, but when I went in there, the funny part of that audition is I walk in and usually they explain everything in the audition breakdown, like what you're going to be doing and what is happening. And I went into there and the guy goes, um, take your shirt off. <laughs> I was like, I was like, okay. And he goes, <laughs> and then, or no, he goes, uh, the first thing he says is, uh, take your pants off. That's what he said. <laughs> Jeez. And I was like, whoa i was like uh that kind of audition hmm. okay and, I was, <laughs> and then he leaves and goes to the bathroom and comes back and i still had my shirt on and he goes i needed to take your shirt off too and he goes and while you're at it grab some potato chips on the couch and i was like this is getting real weird <laughs> <laughs> and so, so i do this i sing that improvised stuff that they asked me to do and then I got a call maybe like a few hours later and they were like, can you, or no, I got a, I get a call the very next morning and they're like, can you come in in two hours? And cause that's how commercials are. They'll, they'll audition you and then they film it in two days. So, and I was like, I don't know if I can come in cause I'm supposed to be going to work right now. And when I was booking Mamma Mia, I was also in the audition process for that. So I was already getting out of work for that and the commercial. So it was a little tough. <laughs> And I said, I couldn't make the callback for the potato chip commercial. And they were like, well, can you make the shoot on Friday? And I was like, yeah. And they were like, great, you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently that never happens. They won't, they do not just hire you from one audition. You have to go to a callback. So the fact that they hired me was amazing. But I, I got that without having to do a callback. It's pretty cool, man. But it is a it is a funny experience. I texted my mom after that, and I was like, "You really can't make this stuff up." I was like, "I just sang opera while eating potato chips in my underwear." Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, but that's 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 an interesting game. And then of the course, reason, so the reason that they needed me in underwear is because the the commercial, in the commercial, I'm singing opera, and it's like breaking glass so i'm singing so hard that the, the my potato pops off and then i'm just holding a bowl of chips <laughs> <laughs> and then i'm standing there in just boxers it's yeah yeah so it's there was method to the madness yeah so there was like a reason it wasn't for anything weird but yeah <laughs> it, it's a pretty terrific commercial i remember seeing <laughs> it it was great <laughs> But you, you speak to that difficulty in, in trying to manage uh, all these these forces. You know, how do I keep my job, let alone work often enough that I, I have money to, to pay rent? How do I make it to auditions? Uh, how do I then make it to any performance commitments? How did you find yourself uh, prioritizing these competing forces? Well, sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. I remember <laughs> when, I, when I moved to Chicago, I... I was getting a lot of callbacks for different things. One of them was Mamma Mia, actually. And then I ended up booking that show seven years later. Um, but I was also in the process of going through Jersey Boys callbacks and the Dirty Dancing National Tour callbacks. So those were all happening like in a span of a week. And 
I was like in a position, I was working at a hostel in Chicago. And I, I remember being like, if I don't go to these, what if I don't go, what will happen? And, and I remember saying, I have to go, I'm going to have to go to these auditions. And the manager of the hostel was like, well, if you go, you, you can't come back. And I was like, well, then I'm not coming back. <laughs> I'm just gonna have to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, the, none of those things, I didn't book any of those things at the time, but I'm glad I still did it. Um, and, but I would say managing the time. Uh, I think this is where things come into play where you, you, you definitely need to set yourself up before, I think before leaving school, if you can set yourself up somehow to have a good job where you can make your own schedule, whatever that is for yourself, um, or if you have a good backup option, um, then do that and start it earlier. Because mine ended up being just working in restaurants and then being able to trade with people. And it, it, it was good a lot of times because I could definitely get into a lot of auditions. But there were definitely times I wish I had done other things or had a, a different background of something. Whether that be teaching voice lessons or whatever that may be. Well, so the, the, Josh, uh, we obviously know each other. We, uh, we we've all crossed paths at Bowling Green. But for those who don't know you as well, um, could you um, could we could we step back a little bit and talk about some of your training and what you did and what you saw as the pathway through school, like you know, mm-hmm. you study and some of that stuff? Uh, because I think a lot of people, um, you know, especially in um, theater, uh, don't. Uh, you know, the pathway isn't always clear. So uh, talk, can you talk to us about your, your, your training and what you did? Yeah, so I went to school at Bowling Green State University from like 01 to 06. I did the five-year plan. Um, <laughs> um, but while I was there, I was also studying acting in the, in the theater department with Dr. Michael Ellison and Jeff Stevenson. Um, and I, I worked with Christopher Scholl, who was... I mean, to this day, still one of my great friends. Um, I just watched your other podcast with Kevin Bilsma, and honestly, I love and adore that man. And he was a, a very integral part of my studies. And actually, my first job with was uh, Toledo Opera with him. And I was in, a sophomore in college. So it's nice to get a gig right off the bat, right in school. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and yeah, I... I I, I felt like I wanted to do a, more than just one type of thing because I wanted to be marketable as a, as a singer. So I wanted to be able to sing lots of stuff, not just opera or not just theater. So that's why I was doing a lot of, I was still singing barbershop quartets with the people in school and getting into choral music as much as I could. Um, and I definitely think that it helped me when I went into the real world because I was able to put all the puzzle pieces together and and make that work for for whatever I was going to be hired for. Awesome! I, uh, I I know I know how diverse your background is, and I think that's so huge. Uh, so I really wanted you to speak to that, that yeah. diversity of opera and theater and choral music. Um, and I I think that I I personally feel. Even if I, I really do feel if you're a music theater person, you should study classical music. And I, uh, the reason I feel that is because you need a good base for when you go out into the real world. Because I, I've seen it on Mamma Mia. I've seen it on, on shows where you're doing the show every day and I watch people get nodes. I watch people get hurt um, and then they get sent home. And, and you know, when you're like 20, and this is your first job is heartbreaking for them to see that. And, and it can be bad for, for them to get hired again. If, if they know that they're not going to be able to um, finish the job really. And that's where I think that I was very lucky in being with people like Christopher Scholl and, and Kevin Bilsma who were taking care of your voice and showing you how to take care of your voice and showing you how to be able to to do that in the real world. It, it, this may be a question that we 
don't really want to get into on camera. Uh, so feel free to, to just back away from it. But uh, as you're watching people firsthand, how much do you feel is people not singing well or not singing healthily using a poor technique? How much is the fact they're doing eight shows a week? How much is extracurricular vocal use where, you know, after a show you need to decompress. So I go out and a party a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think is playing a bigger factor in, in what you saw? I think it's all of those things. One is rest. You need to be able to sleep. Rest is a big factor. Uh, when you're on tour and people are out drinking all the time, it's just something I never got into. I really took care of myself in that. Uh, yes, there are nights where I'd go out and have a few drinks with some friends. And then I might pay for it the next day. I, and, and luckily the technique kicks in. And, but I don't do this all the time and I don't do this several times a week. Um, but yeah, there is a darker side of that where it's people go out there and they party too much and they don't rest and they don't, or they're doing drugs and whatever they're doing and, and they lose it. They can't, they can't sustain the lifestyle. Um, I think that's a great question, John. And, and to piggyback on what you're saying, Josh, cause I think it's, um, I think it's real. Uh, definitely, uh, it's where your technique kicks in. Uh, because if you oh my gosh. That, if you've built that solid technique, um, you don't, you're not relying on the, the stars to align for your voice to work the way you want it to that day. Uh, you know, uh, you you know that you can you can manufacture the sound you need to manufacture based upon yeah. your technique. Even if you're not 100 uh, percent all the time. And there there are many times where even if you're not getting enough rest or no matter what is happening, you still might come down with a little something. You know, these non-union tours, they put you on a bus with like 40 or 50 other people and you basically live on that bus with 40 people. And and if someone gets sick, you know, that's just like COVID. If you're in an enclosed area, you are, it's going to just go right through that bus, no problem. And everyone's going to start getting it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I remember one time I was doing rent and, and I mean, this happened actually in Spamalot too. I did I did one of the shows of Spamalot with about fifty percent of my voice, and thank God, technique kicks in, and I was able to get through all of those things. But one time in Rent, my voice completely went out, and I had to do it's called the Will I solo, um, and it just goes from an F to an F sharp or something like that, and it, it's nothing crazy, but it's just in the worst part of your voice <laughs> and I remember getting through that and one of the some of the people one of the leads was like I don't know how you did that and I was like I just <laughs> I don't know <laughs> thank yeah. God for for people who taught me well that's all I can say mm -hmm. you you lean on that technique um, but I think the environment's also very taxing and I think it's an important thing for people to know because John you bring it up uh, eight shows a week no matter how good your technique is uh, yeah, that's uh, that's no mean that's that's no mean feat, you know. Mm -hmm. I and I've been able to help other people who don't have that training. Like I remember one of my really good friends, Matt. He was just singing like balls to the wall the whole time in Mamma Mia, and I looked at him and he was like, he was asking me like why he's having so many vocal fry problems, and I'm like, you need to back off, sing less, like don't use your head voice, use your falsetto, like. Do what they ask, but use different parts of your voice so that you save yourself. It's very important. I was like, because mm -hmm. you have to do this 282 times in just the span of 10 months. Yeah, the, the, the technique and, and knowing what you can give and when you can give it and, and knowing that there is a finite amount of voice you have in a given period of time. Uh, yeah. is so very important. Um, but I, I think it's, it's also so very important for our young students or our young performers to understand environment and the singing isn't the only contributor to your voice loss. Uh, in fact, no, there are no, some no. who would argue it is, it is the least important contributor to voice loss. Uh, <laughs> I think rest is number one. Rest and, and that pretty much goes with everything. If you're drinking, you're not getting rest. If you're doing whatever else you're doing, you're not getting rest. You are absolutely not getting rest. You have to be able to sleep. Yeah. Especially in a, when you're moving around so much um, and it might be hard to sleep. You have to find ways to sleep. Yeah, that's all. But what I would say is one good thing about 
I think doing a show a bunch of times or um, like what I, I, I used to sing at Disney doing Christmas carols and I would have to memorize like 80 different pieces of music. Um, and then we'd go in and literally sing them at a, at a table and they could just call a song and, you know, doing that kind of stuff. It was a lot of vocal gymnastics and you'd sing for between six and eight hours a day. And I might do that five to six days a week throughout the Christmas season. And it pays really well. Um, and, it, and what I would say is like when you're getting to sing that much, you start realizing how on point your voice becomes like you can drop on a note at, like a needle and you're just always right there as long as you're maintaining yourself yeah that that muscle memory kicks in right uh it's mm -hmm. it's the it's the development of those neural pathways it's why we say practice <laughs> it's and know, through that you are practicing yeah by, you're, by doing you're first practice it makes sense <clears throat> yeah yeah um, that's why i actually have always loved doing the christmas carols is because when i would leave that gig I always felt like I was the most on point I've ever been. Awesome. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Very cool. So you, um, you brought up some really great things. I love that you talked about how, you know, having a, having a teacher, getting good te foundational technique. Um, did you, when you were touring or when you were on cruise ships or anything like that, did you travel with any kind of coaches or teachers that did do any kind of upkeep with some of those cast members? I'm sorry, say that again. Was I, did I have teachers? Did they, or I mean, did, did you travel with them as a cast? Did a cat did, or was it like an MD that worked with the singers along the way? Uh, to kind of keep people <clears throat> um for the ships not so much because once you get out there they kind of leave you um with the touring yes there's always a conductor with you and he'll he'll help you he's not really doing vocal things though i would say that that kind of stuff is more happening in the rehearsal yep. where you're working with a higher up music director Mm -hmm. than the director that's going to go out with you and then the the director the conductor on the mute on the tour will kind of maintain the show that was put up when we leave the rehearsal okay. so he's just maintaining the music um he's maintaining the sound <clears throat> of the show like mama mia had a very specific sound they wanted everything to sound straight tone and like the radio yeah. and so I think with each, especially musicals, and, and I guess you could probably look at that with an opera as well, depending on the company and how they're producing the shows. But what I see is when you're getting hired for a job, whether it be Mamma Mia or Spamalot, that show is a, is a brand name and it's a product. And you have to look at it that way. And that, brought, that product has a sound. And then you go into that audition bringing that sound to the product so that you can basically mimic what they want you have to be able to give them what they want and i would assume for some operas depending on <clears throat> if you're working with certain directors that might be the same yeah and that that requires a certain <laughs> amount of uh networking knowledge and legwork to know going into an audition what are they looking for uh, are, yeah. are they looking well, for you know the, the the woofy opera sound? Are they looking for you know the the new age opera sound? Are they looking for someone right. who does early music kind of stuff? Uh, know your yeah. audience. Absolutely, yeah. and I I definitely think that you have to study study the show, study what that sound of the show is, and then try to bring in something into your audition that is that that sound. Mm -hmm. I Which is where being versatile comes in of being able to be able to change what you're doing. Yeah. And <clears throat> do it in a healthy way. Um, and do it in a healthy way. Yeah. Without different, hurting yourself. <laughs> different shows, different directors, different aesthetics. Um, so John, I don't, I don't know if you have a question. I don't want to go in a deviant direction here. No, go ahead. I'm super curious. Uh, you're looking at going back more into some of the opera stuff uh, or maybe, you know, anything that'll kind of keep you in one place a little bit more. Um, are you, uh, as a seasoned professional, are you looking for a teacher or a coach where you are to help you make that transition? I am. I actually was just speaking with uh, Manita Daniel Cox just recently, another BG grad. 
um, and kind of trying to start taking lessons with her possibly or someone from the Dayton area. But yeah, I think that uh, right before I left New York, I was in New York in 2018 and I was working with a, a really nice guy named Mitchell Serker. And he he's worked with Elizabeth Baldwin um, and he kind of plays, he plays for all the Met auditions and he was really changing my sound. He really, I, I, th I think forever I was thinking I had a bigger tenor sound than I do. And really when I started to scale my voice back, I was like, no, I think I'm a lighter tenor, like a, like more of a Bellini and uh, like Donizetti type tenor. <clears throat> That's interesting. Um, so I'm kind of working more towards that kind of stuff now, and I'm finding it might be better if I stay in that area. Yeah, that's awesome. I, you know, working. I, I, the reason I ask is because I think that a misnomer is that once you're done, you're done, right? And we talk about this a lot with different people on the pod, on the, uh, on the series here. Is um, you know, once you leave school, it doesn't mean your your vocal work is over. Uh, no, God, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> Ooh, no, 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 you that is that is the if people think leaving school is that's where you need to stop. Absolutely not. You are just starting. And you're not even scratching the surface once you leave school. You're just starting. <laughs> <clears throat> because everything I've learned has been probably 98% on the job training. Yeah. including dancing like I was never I was never great at dancing and that's another thing learning how to sing while dancing your face off every night <laughs> and being able to maintain that and have yeah. enough breath support to do it is is asked of you you mean it's not exactly the same as standing in the crook of the piano and, and not moving at all <laughs> completely completely different <laughs> <clears throat> like uh in Mamma Mia so I was in the ensemble in Mamma Mia, and then I covered the three dads. Um, and so I, I went on a lot for those, for the dads. But in the ensemble, there's that, there's the song Voulez-vous, and it's very fast. And it is straight up three minutes, it's like three, three and a half minutes of dancing your face off and, and singing. And I could tell what they were doing in the rehearsal process is, they would have us do these numbers over and over. And it wasn't because they just thought we needed to rehearse it again. It was because they were actually, they were having us do this over and over because they were training our body to get ready to do this eight shows a week. It mm -hmm. wasn't about, hey, we think you need to do the number again. It was because they were trying to build our stamina. Yeah. And I could see that. It's it's an important factor. Uh, I think it's I, this is this huge, and, and the information is is uh, it's important to hear from lots of different places. So I love mm -hmm. I love you brought it up. Uh, I love and I love that you uh, you know you're making a point of saying sometimes you just have to do the training. You know I know uh, actors who you know incorporated for roles that they would they would uh, they would do their cardio regimen on a treadmill or a bike or whatever and. They would uh, they would sing while they did it. <laughs> it really does. It, it makes a big difference, yeah. yeah. I, and I would think that would be great even as an opera singer, even if you were standing wow. still, because it's still going to help you support well. It's going to help you move around on stage more, uh, a lot better. So, yeah. We, uh, I think we compartmentalize opera training sometimes to, to think of it as less physical because we think of it as being that kind of rigid crook of the piano thing. And it's a physical endeavor. It's a marathon, uh, not a sprint. And you need that um, yeah. full body engagement. You know what I mean? And, and just to touch back on the, the training thing, I, I think I'm in the in-between times. I'm constantly doing something. I'm training. I'm learning new music. I'm... I'm practicing something um whether that be a, a taking an acting class or an improv class or whatever i'm i'm constantly thinking of what i can be doing to make progress because so much of this is sitting and waiting for other people to make decisions for you i guess and if you don't do something for yourself then that's all you're going to be doing is just sitting and waiting that's such a huge point. Such a huge point. Um, I mean, you just think about the, the sheer number of auditions that people go on. Um, 
and you'd never hear back from, it, let alone get an actual rejection. Uh, and what can you do to further yourself, to better yourself, to better position yourself for the next time, for the next one, uh, or to make your own opportunities? And that, that's really where our, our, our gig economy as artists is moving. Uh, it's, it's moving away from the, the big bastions, it's moving away from the huge halls, uh, and it's moving towards those who are nimble enough to weather, you know, the major recession after the last, you know, once in a lifetime major recession that we had 10 years ago. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so yeah. sorry, sorry to put a pin on it, but, but, but oh, it's true. We, hey. you know, th th this is now two of them that, that we've had to go through. And we've seen, you know, in the first one, we saw how many opera houses close and we saw how many touring theaters close, close up shop. Uh, and I, I don't want to, to make it look like it's too dire and that people shouldn't go into performing arts because they absolutely should. It's a worthwhile endeavor and it's still a financially viable endeavor. Um, but you have to be nimble enough, you have to be adaptable enough, uh, and you have to be motivated enough uh, to do the Motivation work. Motivation for sure. Yep. You, you, you've got to do it. It's on you. You can't let somebody else determine your direction. You have to be so determined. I mean, the, the part of me is, it, especially for auditions, when you get 100 no's, I'm like, cool, I'm going to wait. I'm going to do what I need to do until I get that one yes, mm -hmm. and I will not stop. And that's mental perseverance as well. I think students need to realize that rejection doesn't necessarily have the negative connotation that it may have had when you were younger, you know? <laughs> we, we think of rejection as a bad thing, but it's just part of what we do. And, well, and, and part of it, what, what I think performers need to realize, the rejection a, a lot of times has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with your talent. Um, it It could be so many factors it could be that they have a three hundred thousand dollar costume and they don't want to you're just too tall <laughs> it could yeah. be it could literally be that <laughs> Sorry, ben, John, ben there. Sticks, so. <laughs> it's, it's no joke like it's for it for real happens like the politics of the game come into play it could be like okay this is the ex example that i gave earlier um i auditioned for the beauty and the beast tour there were two tours of it going out at the one at the moment and i got all the way to the end they they brought me all the way through this audition process for like a two-week process and then they just rehired the two guys who had already done it to play the beast and what can i do about that nothing i can't do anything about it what but you know you were there and that was i was there there yeah. and if those guys if one of those guys didn't want to take the job then i would have gotten the job and these are all factors costumes are definitely a factor especially in something like wicked where some of the costumes are so expensive that they they literally need to hire a specific height and weight to fit that costume so that they don't have to remake this costume. Which brings up a question that all the questions that we probably shouldn't get into on camera, but brings up the question about physicality uh, and what do we look like uh, and what can that do for our career as a hindrance or as a help you know i, I had a colleague once who looked at me and, and said you know if if i if i had your height and your build i'd be working all the time because i go to an audition and 99 out of the 100 guys look exactly like me of course you know he's what five foot ten to six foot and you know jacked uh hey good looking charismatic guy he's like if i could stand out then i'd be working all the time um compare that with you, you stand out too much. You can't fit the costume or you can't work opposite uh, somebody else who's uh, a different size than you are, uh, or you don't have the physical uh, attributes they're looking for for a character. Um, yeah. What role does this play? or what, How have you seen that play out um, in your career so far? A lot. And, I, and I, I think I fit into that kind of category of what you're talking about. Like I look like everybody else. I'm just like a normal dark brown haired guy who's six feet tall and like I'm tall enough and first, you know, it also depends on the gig. And, and I think, um, okay, like certain places like Disney, Disney is so specific about that stuff. If you want to work for Disney, they are, they're probably the most crazy when it comes to fitting into certain things, looking a certain way. Um, then on, on a tour or whatever, they can, they can sort of manipulate that how they want. Um, but I, I definitely think it plays a huge factor and it's happened to me. 
I, I almost got hired for a musical in Los Angeles once, and it was for, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It was like a Kentucky Miners, these Kentucky Miners, I forget what it was called, but the lady called me at the end of the audition. She was like, we love you so much, but you're too tall. <laughs> and I never really got that feedback before. No one had ever just called and been like, we wanted to hire you because you were so good, but you're too tall. And it happens. Yeah. But it was nice to receive that phone call and to say, thanks for at least letting me know that so that you, so that I know that I did at least my job as an actor and as a performer. <laughs> so next time, to- next time when I audition for you, I'll, you know, take three inches off somehow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what's what's great is it could be for something totally different, and then the next time they will hire you. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. There, there is an ongoing discussion that's happening uh, amongst voice teachers, particularly amongst voice teachers who teach musical theater. Uh, it's hit really hard in the Lansing area the last couple of months uh, of w- what do we do? What is our obligation as voice teachers uh, in in working with students that want to go on to sing musical theater? Uh, in preparing them for the reality that the establishment is going to limit what you can sing. Uh, Mm -hmm. And also, do we have an obligation to try and change that paradigm uh, and and try to somehow force the hand of the powers that be uh, into broadening out and and letting talent uh, and vocalism and dynamism on stage be more of a draw than the visual that a person may bring? I think there's a movement in opera as well. Um, I mean, definitely, like, MT is is known for that uh, image-centric theater, um, you know, the the theater aesthetic, but but opera is seeing it as well. Um, Everything is turning into sex. Like, they want... (laughs) They do. It's true. And, and I, you know, you you guys say sometimes you don't like to get into certain things on camera. I think we should. I think we should talk about it all. I don't think that we should... We should hold back. I think we should get into nitty gritty, into the rawness of it, because it's real. And I think that people need to know what they're getting into when they go into the world, that it's real. Oh, and, I, and I'm in full agreement on that. I, I say that mostly as a safety valve uh, for those who are, are <laughs> guesting and, and don't want to get caught unaware. <laughs> yes, fair enough. Sure. I, I want to give the out. I'm willing to go on the line. I, I don't want to make sure. I want to make sure other people are as well before committing to that. <laughs> I, I also think that people need to understand that they're going to be uh, in this business, there are people that will try to take advantage of you. And whether that be they like you because the way that you look and they might be like trying to flirt with you instead of actually work with you. Um, it happens and it's happened to me. And I've seen some really shady stuff <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that can be discouraging, but you just have to leave that person behind and be like, there are other people who will who will actually be here to help. So we've talked a lot about, or we've touched on um, many of the, the downsides of the industry. You know, we've talked about being taken advantage of. We talk about the, the barriers, whether they're physical or, or other. We've, we've talked about the, the grind uh, and how exhausting it can be. Um, what's a favorite memory? What, what's one of the things that kind of keeps you going uh, in this field? Um, some of my favorite memories are really like just the collaboration with other professional performers um, and getting to make something that's super powerful. Um, especially Christmas caroling when you really have to focus on the three other people in your, in your quartet. And when you know that things are syncing up properly, those are great memories. Cause it's like, you know, you're making beautiful music and you're at the top of the top of the game. Um, I've had so many good moments. Um, Mamma Mia, Spamalot was maybe my favorite show I've ever done, just because of the group of people that I was with. Um, And it it really comes down to the people. I really think that the group of people that you're with, that makes it or breaks it. And I I think some of my also favorite memories are in college because you're in you're totally inundated into this environment that you don't get in the real world and when you go out into the real world a lot of things are totally different and you're not amongst as many talented people maybe 
even though you are working the job. <laughs> but I and I think the other part of it that I love, Josh, just I can speak from my perspective is that you, um, you know, when you go into these environments in school, you make um, connections to other artists that you keep forever. Uh, you know, the three of us on screen, we came from the same place, we know the same people. Yeah. Um, it becomes a strong part of your network. And, yeah. uh, and I know, you know, downsides aside, we tend to dwell on them sometimes, especially at a time like this when things look a little bleak for the arts. But, uh, you know, we're making art every day and we're doing it with people that we really enjoy working yeah. with. Yeah. And, and I would say that I, because of Bowling Green, I always have a place to reach back to for when I need help. Mm-hmm. And that's important. I have people I, have people I can contact. Um, I still talk to Greg Ash. I still talk to several people from college that are staples in my life who I, I talked to Dr. Ellison. I talked to Dr. Jeff Stevenson. I still talk to Chris Scholl. Um, you know, these people for when I have questions and I need answers or I just need someone to talk to, that is definitely a factor um, of always being able to reach back and that hand always reaches back to me. <clears throat> Awesome. Uh, Russ, unless you've got another, I, I think that, that leads us to our, our normal ending question. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so enjoying the conversation at this point. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so our, our last question. Away. You can ask me anything. I do uh, not mind at all. Well, th- this will be a fun one. Uh, last question always winds up being, uh, if what would be advice that you have for the up and coming, the young, the college student or just out of college, singer, uh, actor, both? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think you need a, a fire in your chest and that, that's that determination thing. When you leave school, you cannot let that leave you. You have to have it. And if you don't have that, when you walk out of school, you're not going to have the energy to audition and get rejected a hundred million times. Um, I, I definitely think you need to keep studying. School is not the end. It's only the it's only the beginning, and I think studying is a main factor. Like right now, I'm about to go possibly study opera because it's what else am I going to do right now? I might as well go do something else. <laughs> and so, I think that is the main thing. Just keep working, keep working on your skills. I think be logical with yourself. Don't just say you want to play a role, but then go look at it and be like, well, do I really look like this thing? Do I sound like this thing? Be logical and find what find what fits you find what you sound best singing and go do that stuff some great advice hey josh it was great to catch up with you thank you so much for for taking the time Uh, thank you guys i really appreciate it nice to see you all awesome great seeing you you too man